Okay, welcome folks to another episode of the Bish AP podcast. Um, I am absolutely delighted and over the moon um, to welcome our latest guest, number 80, 80 38 I should say. <laughs> uh, I wish it was 80. Um, <laughs> but episode 38 and we're joined by Scotland number one uh, and Scottish golden boy, uh, David Marshall. David, how are you doing mate? Thank you so much for joining us. No, nah, good to be here, guys. Glad to be. I'm not sure about Golden Boy right now. <laughs> old Golden all day, but uh, no, glad, glad to be here, man. Thanks for making the effort as well. Whilst you're, whilst you're on international duty as well, we appreciate that too. No, nah, no problem, no problem. Um, we're also joined by Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, how are we? Kitty doing the full Adidas gear? He certainly. Yeah, no, I thought out. that. Yeah, I thought since Scotland, obviously, I'd stick my Adidas gear on and, and keep it, keep it Adidas. I do, brother. Um, and we're also joined by former pupil uh, and also sports captain uh, and keen goalkeeper, Josh Quigley. Josh, how are you doing, pal? Uh, very well. Thanks for having me on. Good man, good man. Um, David, I'm just going to crack on um, with the questions. Uh, the very first question, there's, there's, there's two men on here who, who came from St Andrews, uh, probably quite possibly the best school in Scotland, is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, right. so how did you... How did you find? How did you find your school career at the best school in Scotland? Uh, and did you stay on? Did you leave in fourth or fifth year? Uh, uh, Mr. Moldew, here's us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a great um, school. Uh, I, I left in fourth year. Um, obviously, I was lucky enough that I was told, kind of halfway through fourth year, that I would get a contract at Celtic. Um, it was quite a long, long contract as well. It was like a four year. Um, kind of pro youth contract so leaving there was it was easy for me because obviously being a Celtic fan and then um, getting that opportunity um, and it being four years as well it wasn't like it was a one year deal where you'd maybe say I'm not sure I need to stay on at school and, and see how it goes so um, yeah lucky I had that backing and um, probably switched off a wee bit the last few months of the, the fourth year but um, obviously all thoughts were going towards going to going to full time myself. Did you have any favourite subjects? Can I influential role models when you were when you were at school growing up? It was always PE for me. Um, I was always big big into sport. Um, coming through primary school, secondary school, but the kind of annoying thing about Celtic at the time is they stopped you playing for your high school. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they kind of are. Uh, I think it was about age fourteen. So they kind of went through youth and. Um, they kind of stopped you playing. You're playing with your mates. That's the most enjoyable part of it. Do you know what I mean? You're enjoying your football. There's no worries. Um, and then Celtic are worried about getting you injured and stuff. So a few times, actually, you just sneaked away to play with your, your high school and just hope sell it when they find out. <laughs> and obviously, me being a goalkeeper in high school, tried to play striker and just, just as I say, enjoy it with pals. But um, no, it was always sport for me. It was always good pupil, like focus and stuff. But um, obviously, when you get that carrot of, listen, you're going full-time with Celtic, it changes Changes everything. What was your, your teacher's perception of you be? If I was to take a walk up to Torf and Crescent, what would, what would they be saying? I think it'd be all good, to be fair. Um, <laughs> I think I've, had, I've had a few moments in my career where you can I you get the kind of newspapers or the press maybe do an interview with, with head teachers and stuff, um, and, and teachers fail. But um, no, as I say, I was I was I did have good relationship with, with teachers in school, and uh, I did uh, academically did okay. Um, but as I say, the focus was was mainly um, the sport. But there was always uh, I was a, I was a good pupil. I would I would I would say. Brilliant. On to something after that went to Bishop Briggs Academy. Yeah, just on that, David, we, we were speaking to uh, Mister Molesdale, the head teacher at, at the school at Winston today, and he said he actually he used to work at a school uh, Hill Park that used to play against you. There was a wee bit of a, a rivalry there. He said, and uh, yeah. he remembers he remembers you playing. But you played outfield a couple of times right. against them. Uh, well, that, as I say, that's what I said. I used to always, because we say, like, you were training Monday, I trained with Celtic, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, uh, yep. Friday nights, played played Saturday and then sometimes played the Sunday as well. So um, the amount of goalkeeping I was doing was just constant, constant, and I loved it. But it's a bit of a release, just something different. I think it did help, playing outfield. And yeah. um, obviously I was never at a standard that I was going to go any further than that. But... Uh, uh, I did enjoy it, and it was a bit of a release for the, well, obviously, six days a week playing, playing goals. Yeah. Did you say striker then? 
Wait a few times. Nah, I'm not going to go sit and hop, am I? If I can't get field. So um, I was always, always uh, the target man. I. Good. Uh, right, so my next question is just about where it all all started, David. Mm-hmm. So how did you get into football? Kind of, how did it how did it come about? Um, just playing uh, in the street, really. My obviously my big used to play with my big brothers, mate. So being the youngest of the group, find yeah. yourself in goals. Um, and obviously, I think it's changed days now. Back when I was growing up, you were there was a lot of sport. Um, like out, out for uh, football in the street and stuff. Um, it was just normal for us. There was none of the kind of social media, obviously, the in computers as much as, as there is now. Um, in terms of Celtic, I went for a trial, just replied to a, a newspaper article um, in Evening Times for a trial under 10s. Um, and we had the trial down at London, London Road Primary School, which is gone now, demolished now. We turned up at that trial and it was about... Honestly, I felt it was if it was like five thousand kids there for a trial. So it took about two or three weeks to, to narrow down to a squad. Um it was at Celtic Boys Club for I think two years, three years, and then it changed they kind of merged all the they took the kind of best players they thought at the time and merged them into the Celtics official pro youth team. And that's right. when it got a bit more serious. So then it went, as I said, the Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday evening training. Um Friday. Thursday was a day off, Friday night training, and then playing both days and the weekends. Uh, so that's how the Celtic thing started. As I say, it was just going to reply into to an article in the, in the paper. Why? Why the goalkeeping? Why? Why goalkeeping? Like, what was the? I've been asked. I've been asked this a lot. I did love it. Um, I just love. I just when I was growing up, the um, Sky Sports had just started really showing the Premier League um, constantly. So there was big. Like personalities goalkeepers, Peter Smeichel was there, and it was always uh, somebody I looked up to. Um, and I don't know, it was just something that I always enjoyed. I think when I was proper young, maybe eight, nine, ten, when I was playing my big brother's mates, I was chucked in goals because I was the youngest one. Nobody wanted to do it, but from there it probably just grew. Um, and, and yeah, just enjoyed it. Obviously, when you're good at something, you're naturally good at it. You kind of enjoy it that bit more, um, have that passion for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I say, the, in in the early times, it was probably chucked in there with my, my big brother and his mates. Still me, Mister McCoy. Oh yeah. So when you were growing up, did you have any part time jobs, David? I never know. Um, at all. <laughs> no, I think everybody used to do the paper run. Um, yep. But I spent that much football. Honestly, it was just never something that I think a lot of my mates did the paper run, and then one of the ones you get the papers, and then. Just chucked him away and he got paid. As soon as you got paid, you were done. But um, yeah. no, I walked out a few times with my mates. But uh, as I say, when, when Celtic went pro youth, the um, the schedule was when you look back, it was pretty heavy five, six nights a week. Yeah. Um, so no, I was lucky enough that obviously I left school in fourth year as well, so I didn't really have to do anything. Um, but no, growing up, I was life away, wasn't it? Clean dishes, make sure your room was tidy, all that sort of stuff. That was your job. That was it. I dig money to my man. That was that was sound. Uh. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we're going to move on to your professional career. And uh, Josh, I think, does get the next question. Uh, yeah, first question would be What has your professional career journey been like? Um, well, it's very long. Um, it was such a high for me. Like, obviously, signing for Celtic when I was so young was massive and then getting into the first team at Celtic came really, really quickly as you guys probably know in terms of getting chucked in against Barcelona at 19 um, and as I think everybody probably remembers and looks at people's career and remembers the real highs but uh, so there was real lows at Celtic for me because I was a big Celtic fan so I went for a season ticket holder gone to the games with my family my mates to then the pressure of playing for Celtic every week um, and I don't think at 19 I was I was ready, obviously. I was talented and the Barcelona game, you get chucked in and you, you do okay. Um, but I wasn't experienced enough, experienced enough to deal with kind of mistakes. Um, so there was real lows. It was obviously real high doing what I did for Celtic at such a young age. Um, leaving Celtic was such a such a low point for me. But I just felt as if I had to, to go and... I wanted to be a first-team keeper. You don't, I'd never really had... I wouldn't have been happy growing up and say, oh, he's Celtics number two or Celtics number three. I just I wanted to go and 
have a long career and uh, and and kind of be tested and relied upon their team. So um went to Norwich on loan. Peter Grant was a the manager there, so probably quite lucky um, in terms of the Celtic connections. Um, got me there. I played 100 games in two years for Norwich and got like a level of consistency in the Championship and gave me probably a bit of belief in myself that I could play, um, especially down south, because a lot of lads were down south. And I knew a few people that went down south, maybe had never really worked to it, couldn't say it, I won't come back. And I didn't want to be that either. So, um, Probably the best time I've had at club level was Cardiff after Norwich. I had seven years there and the first five were brilliant. We went, I think we went playoffs, playoff final, playoff semi-final, playoff semi-final and then we won the league with Cardiff to get to the Premier League, um, which was amazing. Again, lows along the way. The first year of the season at Cardiff was brilliant. Right up to the last game, we lost the playoff final against Blackpool, which is up there with a probably the lowest point in my career to be honest when you lose that because he just feels off, especially when we were heavy favourites against Blackpool that day um, but overall the Cardiff experience was good it was obviously I played in the Premier League and that was one of my personally one of your best seasons so uh, you were recognised then so it's been a long a long career um, Hull was a bit stop start there was a lot of change at Hull a lot of change of managers I, had, I think I had five goalie coaches in months at Hull so it's is, that difficult? Are, is that a difficult uh, thing? Like in terms of different goalkeeper coaches and all the time? It's something that I never really experienced until when a new manager comes in, you expect a new goalie coach, so you get that. Right. But how it was just um yeah, I joined Steve Bruce had left. So it was kind of Steve Bruce that signed me, but just left just before I signed. And then his goalie coach said that oh, I'm staying, so like everything will be the same, which he did for six weeks. Then he went to Villa. Right. Um so then a goalie coach came in for another six weeks. It didn't work out and left. So I ended up having five in 18 months, which was just ridiculous. So it was uh, that that was tough to deal with, especially when, when you sign for a club, especially in a goalkeeping position, like you know, Josh, you sign, the, the goalkeeping coach is a big say in it. So then when he leaves, initially you're, you're almost back to square one. So you're obviously, that, that goalie coach should maybe have your back or um, he would push you. Even if you you weren't playing so well, do you know what I mean? So he that would be the guy who you trust. But to have five in eighteen months was was probably the most difficult spell. Right. Um, but eventually it came good. The last eighteen months for were, were good at Hull. Um, went to Wigan with the obviously went in administration. So um, a lot. As I say, it's not easy. The football is you go highs and lows. Um, I think the players probably remember the lows more than the highs and the fans can I just see the, the, the highs of it um, but it's, it can be a slog at times but it's, it is rewarding but looking back especially obviously the international thing now's went really well that's been I mean I've been in the squad for kind of 17 years and there's been it's been almost all lows until the last kind yeah. of 18 months so um, it's, you feel vindicated and rewarded for the, the hard work that goes in that obviously people don't see in the background um, but um, uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work to get to to get to those highs. Throughout your your career, David, you've you've played probably with and, and again some top top quality players. Is there any that can I stand out for you in any particular reason why? Um, obviously that we've served it when I came through the Barcelona game was such a big game, but um, you just felt those players were just a different level, a step mm-hmm. ahead. Um. Ronaldinho obviously was like the, the main kind of best player in the world at the time and um, it was just so different so I think he would be probably the best if not one of the best I've played against um, I remember at Norwich we drew Jose Mourinho's Chelsea team his first kind of spell with Chelsea and they were different, like drop up was a different class um, they had a real real good squad but lucky enough when we got to the Premier League you played against kind of most Obviously, my manager just now is, is Wayne Rooney at club level, but him and the, the man you side that, that they had um, in Bread and Rogers Liverpool team were that season where they we almost won it. It um, was the season we were in we were in the Premier League with, with Cardiff, so it was like Suarez and Sturridge. Suarez was that season, I think he was, I don't know how many goals he scored, but he was. I think it goes down as one of the, the best seasons as a striker in the Prem, so I've been lucky enough to play against a right good few good players. See, in terms of obviously with you, you mentioned the likes of 
like that game against Barcelona, but in that team as well, what was it like like kind of training with the guys that, as you say, you, you bought the season ticket, these were the guys that you were idol, idolising? That was a weird thing, yeah. That was probably, I had a goalie coach at the time at Celtic, um, Terry Geno, he was he was different class. So the, when I was saying before, when I was at school, when we, we trained in the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Fridays, the, uh, he started, uh, so he came in as first team goalkeeping coach, but as soon as he came into the club, he wanted to, uh, all the goalkeepers to train together, all the way down for under 10s, all the way up. So on a Tuesday evening, it was just the goalies used to train uh, Celtic's first team training ground, which was Barrafield at the time. So we were actually getting trained on a Tuesday night with Celtic's first team goalkeeping coach, which for me was different class. So obviously, I had a bit of talent and obviously maybe seen something that um so I had a good relationship with Terry. Um so uh when them when I went full time at sixteen, I would train with the first team goalies twice a week. Um and eventually when obviously Terry thought I was maybe ready, I'd then play in the the games, some of the training games. So I'm nowhere near playing in the first team in terms of league games and stuff. But at sixteen, seventeen I was always training with the first team. So I think it that mm-hmm. builds up that um, mentality because that, that that side as you mentioned the amount of characters in there um, but it was such a big we used to play a young well they used to play a young the old game on a Friday <laughs> and it was relentless it was the most competitive game it was more competitive than a game the next day in the league unless it was full form game <laughs> um, so to get chucked in and that was like if you speak to any of the lads coming through at that time that was like sink or swim because if you went in there and had a bad game you okay. get hammered kind of thing so um, yeah it was, it was brilliant that, as I say that stood me in good stead I think anybody who's left if you look at the lads there like Sean Maloney Aidan McGeady Craig Beatty myself Ross Wallace the, that team who were all part of that first team in that environment um, not in terms of the coaching but just in terms of how hard it was and the expectation and the training they've all really kicked on to, to big well have good careers anyway mm-hmm. Josh, what about you? Uh, what was your biggest highlight in your professional career as a goalkeeper? Uh, it was probably November, the Scotland stuff. I think it's difficult. Um, as I say, I was such a big Celtic fan growing up that it was the be all and end all for me as a, as a young kid growing up, like East End of Glasgow, and to to play for Celtic. And um, if you ask me before November, I'd have probably said that the Celtic stuff um, I think at Cardiff as well we they'd never been to the Premier League so it was such a big thing for for the the, the club in the city there um, we'd obviously almost got there with the playoff final and lost in semi-finals but to win the league and get to the Premier League was huge um, but the Scotland thing you just to play for your country um, the start of my Scotland career Craig and, and Alan McGregor were obviously playing a lot before me so it was tough to get games but as soon as you play one game for Scotland, you just it just feels different. Um, everybody's behind you. Uh, everybody's what you do well, which is a c- complete opposite of club football. Um, but in terms of the highlight, obviously, November qualifying for the Euros is something. Getting to my age, I thought almost last chance saloon. So to, to do it last November is, I think, everybody had a right good night that night. Um, what to come, come about that? Don't worry, we're not finished on that. Talk. To, um, <laughs> No, it was, it was so good. That's, I mean, it'd be impossible for to have any other highlight than, than that. Magnificent. Uh, next question is, with some highlights uh, become some low points, uh, can you recall any p- particular setbacks which you had throughout your career? Yeah, I think the playoff final when we lost um, to Blackpool. Um, we were 1-1 one one now, 1-2, one 1-2 each, one two, one two each, and then 3-2 down at half time. I've came to a corner and kind of got half a punch on it. Um, I think it was 2-1 to us at the time. They scored, went two each, um, and uh, eventually we lost the game 3-2. So that was, I was so low after that game. I remember getting into the players' lounge and um, your family's there. And you know, I was just, as I say, it took me a long, long time to get over that one. I actually got injured in the playoff semi-final, but kind of played in the final because it was such a big game and uh, ended up needing an operation in my elbow the next season. But, uh, that was a real low point. It took me a while to go over that, to be fair. Nearly left the club, um, but eventually got back in. Malcolm McKay became manager and obviously kind of knew me for the, the Scottish setup. And 
and put me put me back in and we ended up winning the league. So I would say that was that was in terms of a game was a low point. Um I think leaving Celtic was was always was difficult for me. I think I knew, I knew it was coming, so it was probably wasn't as harsh. Um but the uh obviously being there and when you're growing up and then you get first team debut so you want to be a Celtic player for forever really. Um but that was that was a tough one to, to move on but as I say it was the right decision. I'm not I'm not looking for an exclusive here but is there a possibility of a return? No, it is I've not had any chat with anybody like that. obviously I signed a two year I, I only had one year left at Wigan um, but then the administration stuff happened yeah. so in the summer I was kind of free um, because of the administration thing or more or less free and um, obviously Derby came in um, and they signed a two year deal there so I've got another year at, at Derby so I've never really heard anything you know to that side I had to ask sorry yeah, sorry <laughs> mate get out of time <laughs> Scott, over to you. My next question is about initiations. So we've asked this a, kind of, a couple of times just to different people. Have you got any yeah. funny initiation stories? Well, initiations have always just been so obvious. You've seen that, you've seen that air, but um, it's always just been songs. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, there's a few clubs I've heard that they did stand-up comedy routines or stuff like that, but um, I've always just been songs, and I was lucky. I never had to sing until uh, I got to Hull. Um right. And then, Did you manage to avoid it today? Uh, I know. So uh, Cardiff, we never done it. I think Cardiff is the best one because you just have to take your lads out for a drink, which was brilliant pre-season. Oh, you just have to pay for a drink and have a night out. Um, but I, it was, I hate singing as well, man. I absolutely hate what it. Was that? What was that song? It was um, American Pie. <laughs> <laughs> you need know, to just be loud and get everybody going. But um, oh, yeah. I just, some painful singers like it. lads are fine if you have a laugh in that it's fine but some lads up there are really nervous sweating and that and uh, it's, it's no nice is it Which I think one of the Raina? best ones I've seen was Raina Raina's was good who's uh, that Pepe Raina aye was, I'm sure it was uh, Despacito I think he sang oh, was he, <laughs> Justin Bieber <laughs> I imagine he's got a bass ah, yeah, <laughs> 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 he dance moving as well he sang the chorus for 30 seconds and then just sat down <laughs> Yeah, you've, you've, either, you've either got to go hard or just go home, haven't you? It's kind oh, of a nice. nice. go loud, aye. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything with the Scotland set up? Do you do anything kind of new players yeah. coming in? Obviously, are new players this week? No, you don't really do that, to be fair. I know the Scotland thing. I think, um, aye, I've never really thought about that, but no, it's, it's, all, it's only club level that, that, that happens. It's a horrible feeling as well, because at the club level, you, your first meal, you just sit down and then you just hear somebody tapping the glass and that means singers are up it's yeah. the worst feeling in the world so um, it doesn't even stop when you get a bit older I think to have a bit more respect for the older ones but uh, no but the Scotland team is near is near initiation so it's hard enough singing the national anthem right enough but um, <laughs> no the initiation's here thankfully Brilliant Josh uh, yep uh, my next one is as a goalkeeper do you have any separate preparation for a match uh, that you would do different from an outfield player um, I will, we'll go through analysis uh, well, for instance at Scotland we'll go through the goals probably the last kind of 15-20 goals that um, the, who we're playing just to see if there's any patterns of it I'll see um, and you usually find there are I think we went through recently and you'll maybe find we'll go through the last 20 and you maybe find that maybe over half will be from corners or over Two thirds will be for the same side, um, or maybe a striker likes to finish in a certain way. Yeah. So we'll just go through that. Um, sometimes it's nothing, but it, it can help. And obviously, the the main thing over the last couple of months has been the penalties. We can go back, fortunately, yeah. like we can go back years on people's penalties. So, um, but that, that's been quite important. Obviously, with the semi final and the final. Um, so I we kind of look for ways that teams score. I think in the last few years and goalkeeping it's changed at club level as well for in terms of who you're playing so if we were playing somebody like a Leeds who very rarely just put the ball in the box say they'll play a lot of short passes around the box a lot of cut back try to get to the byline the training and the week building up to the Saturday will be more like that and whereas if we played just for example in early Cardiff are really direct so Cardiff have three big centre-halves big striker the wingers are told get crosses in early 
then we'll tailor the, the goalkeeping coach will tailor the week to train like that Monday to Friday just in preparation for it um, we've got so many games sometimes it can be difficult um, but yeah there's a lot more analysis done probably the last three, four, five years than I had certainly in the early part of my career Great Team for, for a shootout then David are you are you thinking about each of the different players then and you're thinking about their past penalties and, and what way you're going to go is it just when it gets to that stage when you've got more penalty takers are you, are you just guessing aside or are you um, no, but we will look at the. I think most players tend tend to revert to what they're confident in, um, uh-huh. and I'll be the same in, in in the way I play as well. Um, but yeah, for instance, a mistreach penalty. Yeah, it only kind of really on when we watched these clips of the last in twenty penalties. He went central or he went left. Yeah, and he, a couple of weeks before he missed a central one at Sheffield United. He hit the bar, so we kind of I thought. He's not going central if it's a big penalty, mm-hmm. so he was he was going to go left. So um, you're almost in your head smiling because you know if I go left and if he goes left, I have a real good chance of saving it. Yeah. Um, but for instance, the first one uh, in Serbia, the boy Tadic, we watched maybe ten penalties. I think he went two up the middle and eight um, left. Right. So. In my head, I was thinking the two. It's how it's how deep you think about it. So the two up the middle, one of them was a real important penalty. It was a Champions League, and they were drawn at the time. And I think it was the last five minutes. So I was thinking maybe in a real important penalty, he'll go safe and go up the middle. But mm-hmm. eight of the penalties he went left. So we gambled and went left, and he obviously just stuck up the middle. But um, it is your decision ultimately. But mm-hmm. um, at the same time, as obviously Stevie would see that Scotland does a lot of work, and we do a lot of work in analysis. So. Uh, if I kind of stood in the middle and he went left, uh, would say would be like, "What are you doing?" We'll just like, told you where to go, kind of thing. So um, ultimately, it's your decision, but there's a lot of work and, and thought that can go on it as well. Yeah, you've, you've obviously you've obviously got a lot of experience from playing, but do you still have any mental preparation within that as well? Um, the the time I write stuff down. Um, okay. So it's just memories. I think um, I don't think all the time, um, but reminders maybe. Every four, 46 weeks, um, sometimes I've just like gone to the toilet and just write some stuff down on my phone, um, some stuff just to focus on and, and just remember. Um, I've just processed you've been going to the toilet and writing stuff down on your phone? Well, just on your notes on your phone. <laughs> I, like, like, uh, I just like, kind of, just to get you focused and just kind of a, a wee refresher, do you know what I mean? So, because um, sometimes you can just get into a routine, and if you're yeah. doing you're playing okay and stuff, you can get a bit, uh, you don't want to get lazy on it, do you know what I mean? So just take it. So, just to refresh and um, just little things like, um, just, yeah, just reminders really uh, uh, what, what's what you're doing well and to keep it going and um, not to take chances and stuff, and obviously just focus the mind. So, um, I nothing religiously, every game I would do or something set. Um, but I just to just to keep yourself mentally mentally right for the game. Brilliant. Um, the match against Serbia um, will go down in Scottish football history. Mm-hmm. Um, what what can you recall from that night? Like, did, did you get a chance to enjoy it? Can I celebrate with the lads? Oh, I get a chance to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just trying it. Um, <laughs> uh, the game itself was weird because obviously in this kind of COVID. Uh, times it's like the, the stadium's empty it was a weird stadium anyway it was really open the pitch was terrible the dressing room was a mile away from the pitch so um, I just felt really good the whole day um, that I think the away teams have always done well in kind of COVID times like I said so I felt I think um, Man U were flying at the time and away from home they'd won so many games so Scott McTominay was in the team I think Celtic had a couple of good away results um, at the time, so like Cal McGregor was there. Um, I think Liverpool were struggling a wee bit, but their good performances came away from home in Europe and stuff, and not obviously Andy's there. And I just felt like in the tunnel walking at the pitch, I just felt really good about the, the game. And as it turned out, the boys were brilliant. I mean, the, the 90 minutes, um, it was, especially first half, I was like, this is, if we scored first here, this is a matter of time kind of thing. And as of course, it just panned out to be such a, an epic game, but it should have been really comfortable. So um, in terms of the morning of the game and the actual build-up to it, it felt really good. When they scored, it was gut-wrenching, man, because obviously you feel like fans, you just feel as if the momentum swings. And we had, 
I think the first five minutes of extra time was so nervy and we were under 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 the cosh because they put all the strikers on so we knew it was one way traffic coming but managed to get through it and I suppose it would have been great to win it in 90 minutes but just because of the excitement and you're obviously on the right end of the result to do it the way we've done it I think everybody um, probably enjoyed it that bit, that bit more Celebrations after? Ah, brilliant eh? Yeah. Uh, the only thing that killed me a wee bit is you have to do the pre- like, obviously some players have to go and do the press after it so the press room was like 10 minutes away we had to get a car to the press room after the game so it's 10 minutes here 20 minutes press I probably missed 40 minutes in the dressing room straight after yeah. it um, but like, the hotel was was different class um, obviously because nobody can go anywhere as well it was like an old fashioned lock in really so and I think <laughs> all the staff being there who have been through that nobody sees, but they do so much. Like it's it's hard work for the ten days in, in camp, and we'd been together for for a lot. Like I think it was nine games, three months, um, September, October, November. It was it was just so good and just so natural, and um, it was such a great night. I could do it, like even when we went to bed at like six a.m. I was I could have stayed up longer, but it was like get to bed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just it was so good. It was such like a rewarding like time. So. Just something you can just sit back and it was good as well because usually when you win a game of football, it's like you've won a cup or final and that's it done. Yeah. Obviously, we know we've got something to look forward to in the summer. So, um, yeah. no, great night. I think it was it, it was a timely. It came at the right time. I think it's at the moment the obviously everything that's going on, but the, the international team has, has been in the shadows. I think for a long time, <laughs> and and I think now. Kids are, are now seeing these idols, now seeing these role models and thinking that I want to be like that again, you know, and I think the Scotland yeah. team is, is just taking off once again. Oh, well, I think so. Um, we've got a great young squad. I mean, if you look at the, the level the lads are playing, especially the Premier League lads, uh, down south, like McTominay's kicked on massively. Obviously, Andy's had a fantastic few years. KT's back fit. Yeah. Arsenal and McGinn's always been a big player. So and this, we've got some good, right good young lads and lads are playing at a right good level so I it's good these, these fans and supporters and kids like myself obviously I'm old enough that I can remember 96 and 98 um, and then when I went into the squad when my first squad was Betty Vokes and it was just kind of taken that we would qualify it's something like yeah. even if we missed that one we get the next one and it just rolled and rolled and rolled and it, everybody just getting into that mentality of we're not going to qualify and that, that yeah. it was an acceptance but um now the manager's changed that. Uh, the players have been great. And as I say, it's not as if we've kind of flipped out of that. I think the performance in Serbia and, and the months before that has like, picked up massively. So hopefully we can we can kick on and have a good Euros and you know, just kind of get there and, and, and it be a failure kind of thing. We want to, we want to do well there. Yep. Mr Johnson? So what, that just leads into my next question. So looking at the, the Euros, what would you say are the kind of targets <laughs> for you personally, but then as a, as a squad as well? I think as a squad that getting out of the group's got to be the uh, is yeah. the target. Um, obviously, it's it's a tough group and it the kind of glamour game with England as well. Um, but I personally is to keep the form going, to stay fit and, and playing it would be would be the personal um, and play well. That would be the personal um, goal. But as I say, I don't think a Scotland team's made it out of the group, so that's that's yeah. the ultimate aim. And then obviously, if that happens, we can reassess again. Take it for that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that was a, a kind of question. Obviously, at the moment you're on, you're obviously on international duty. You're, you're kind of sitting about in the hotel. I've watched. I don't know if you've seen Ben Foster, the cycling GK. So, in, well, I have no Ben. Uh, if you're playing against him, yeah, and it's it's quite fascinating to see kind of behind the scenes what it's like. So, I'm just quite interested. Like, what's this week like? What, what's the plan? What, what do you do when you're kind of away in international duty? Yeah. Well, it's been curtailed a wee bit with the COVID stuff so we are kind of told to stay at each other's rooms and stuff so obviously it's, it's a little bit different um, the dining rooms kind of split up and stuff so it's probably not as together right. as as usual um, obviously the, you, the we've got kind of rooms you can go and play pool or table tennis and stuff um, we just train in the morning I think who, about, who, are we talking, who are we talking pool kings who's the pool kings who's the champs in the table well, tennis we had a pink we had a ping pong table last month. This is the first time we've had a pool table, but it's got a slope on at least. I've heard it's horrific. <laughs> so um, we tried to have a game, but it wasn't worth it uh, in the meeting room. But I, there's, there's everything here. I think the, the setup's great. 
the lads are training in the morning and then there's a kind of four o'clock gym session. Right. Um, but I, there's usually a lot of cards and lads will just sit and uh, go to the pool and ping pong stuff. But a lot of it's, as I say, curtailed with COVID. We need to try and keep us apart um, as much as possible. Um, so I, it, it can get boring, especially because of that kind of restrictions. Um, but as a real good like, kind of um, camaraderie with the lads, a lot of lads coming through, a lot of similar age. Um, so it's no, it's really it's a really good group. Normally, who's your who's your roommate? Who you who you rooming with when you're away? Who, uh, usually, well, usually, I've not had a roommate since we Maloney left. So I was with Shawnee. <laughs> um, so since we Shawnee's retired, um, it's just been on my on myself. Um, but as I say, nobody can share me because of COVID. We're all we're all single rooms. Um, so I uh, it's hopefully by summer we can get we can get back to normal. But um. Uh, I was Maloney. I think big, I was big Craig Gordon for years, and big Craig got injured and stuff, and then I was I was in me, me Shawnee until until he retired. You'll be you'll be avoiding the likes of KT and his music and stuff like that. Are you? We want a good night's sleep. I uh, well, KT and KT Ryan. They're the oh he was the DJ. I so KT Ryan and um, a few other lads are the Call of Duty lads. So they're they're buzzing, training, finish at twelve, and just locked in the room. Then um, <laughs> o'clock at night. <laughs> uh, um, stay away from Big McBurney's room and all costs <laughs> um, but, but no as I say I think lads would be in each other's rooms and playing computer playing cards and stuff but obviously that with the computer now we've just been on Wi-Fi and in each other's room but boring but that's what it is hopefully back to normal soon yeah Josh you have uh, your yep. final question uh, oh, yeah final question is what advice would you give to any young aspiring footballers slash athletes um you need to enjoy it for me. Um, I think, obviously, most people that go into that kind of walk of life would, Josh. Um, yep. But I, in, in enjoyment, especially especially at a young age, especially going through high school, um, I think there's so much information out there as well for, obviously, people that are doing different sports and different athletes now that I would, I would never have. So um, in terms of fitness, uh, making yourself better, um, and not putting too much pressure on yourself, um, as a as a massive thing because obviously when I grew up, the social media side was was not there, um, and it's something that probably a lot of lads in in this squad and first team football can't deal with anyway. Uh, it's, it's so tough. So um, yeah, I think if you work, work hard and you know yourself, you've gave gave everything, um, then you should you should get have that enjoyment because that's the, the pressure should come with yourself because there's going to be so much pressure eventually coming from obviously myself being a footballer comes from outside sources or running games or whatever uh, athletic like sport you go into there's always going to be that pressure eventually um, but just enjoy it um, because as I say it goes so quickly um, that you have to especially at a young age Perfect Mr Johnson sorry you've got David, the finisher I've, I've got the finisher so I'm just looking for your five-a-side team. If you were to give a five-a-side team of players, past or present, who would they be and why? I've played with it. No, just in. Anyone? Um, five-a-side team. I would have to go in goals. I would go... I'd go Peter Smeichel. He was my hero growing up. Peter Smeichel in goals. Um, I thought you were going to put yourself in. You wouldn't even put no, yourself in goals. No chance. No <laughs> chance. Um... Peter Smith, well, I think I'd have to, I'd have to put Henrik Larson in. Um, yeah. Obviously, playing with a guy, I was like, hero man, and then obviously I got the chance to to go in and train and see him play, and it was just ridiculous. What was he like? He's just on a day-to-day basis, to, like in terms of training, what was he like? Was it just different class, just 10 shoulders above? No, it, it, was, it was just a different level. He was a really nice, a quiet guy, but a really, really nice guy. Um, had like, you know, Grew up two or three friends, but um, not loud, um, humble. Um, but the way he trained was just ridiculous. I always remember the night in, in Seville when we lost. Um, and Henrik, it's one of the great ones. He's such a good player that you hope in a final that the best player plays. Exactly. Does he sell justice? But he yeah. did more than that. He carried. He was incredible that night. And I've never seen somebody go so gutted. He took it so hard. And deservedly so because he kind of, Dragged us there and, and almost won it as well. So he was just, yeah, probably, probably the best player I've played with. But um, yeah, just a different level. Carried himself so well. So um, 
like selfishly, obviously at Celtic, we kept him for so long, but he really should have went kicked on. I know he managed to get Man United and Barca, but I would, yeah. the career he obviously could have had, and well, what he could have won anyway, um, yeah. he'd have went a little bit earlier. Um, so uh, Henrik would, would have to have been there for me. Um, I'm trying to think, is this difficult? They're such good players, aren't they? Um, I love Steven Gerrard. Um, obviously, I was a Celtic fan, and John's just jumped. Oh, to see there. But um, I did. I find it difficult now. I'm like Steven Gerrard, Rangers. But um, no, nah, for me, like I used to, I used to love Liverpool growing up. Um, and he was just like you know, almost as if he carried, um, carried that club at times, didn't he? Uh, so and obviously the, the European Cup final in Istanbul, everybody remembers. So I'd have to go. Michael, Gerard, Larson, uh, I need a defender. I'd have to go Van Dijk. Um, different class. And then I'd have to put a Maverick in there. I'd have to put Ronaldinho in there just for the just for the fun factor. So um, I think that would be tough, tough to beat. I'm, lo- I'm looking for a, a team name at all. What are we giving the team name? <laughs> be careful, remember? I know, I'd be careful. I don't know what could be called that. It's a bit of a mix, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Marshall's don't know. Mavericks. Marshall's Mavericks, there we go. Marshall, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, David, that is uh, all our questions. Um, I think I don't know if Josh, Scott, you get any, any? No, that was brilliant. No. no. Um, I've, been, I've been covered. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us. As I said kind of at the beginning, um, really do appreciate somebody like yourself giving up time. It's such a, a, a busy time for you. Um, so thank you so, so much. No, I know worries, guys. You need anything else, just give us a text if you want anything else. Just ask in the mail or whatever. That could, be the worst thing, that could be the worst thing you've just no, said. just give a shout, honestly, because <laughs> not too much here anyway. So um, I just give us a shout. Superb. Um, Mr. Johnson, Josh, thank you so much. Josh, I hope you're... you're you're doing well um, and all the best in the future with whatever's coming up for you. Uh, good luck, Josh. Hope it goes well, bud. Cheers. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. All right. Um, you can catch up on this episode and all our other episodes on our YouTube channel uh, or our Twitter, at BishyP, and our Brad Spanking new Instagram page, uh, at Bishy.p. All right. Cheers. Take good, care. Good, 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 luck this week good luck this summer as well. Cheers. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Bye. Thank you.